guys, welcome back to the TA Targets channel. Today we got a little bit of a different format, one that we've done a lot in the past, and that is a comment response video. So you might have already seen the video that I'm gonna be referencing a lot. It's the thermal will get you killed video. So a little bit different flavor of a video on the TA Targets channel, and it popped off like crazy. And there, as of the recording of this video, there's around a thousand comments, I think, right, Brenton? Yeah, I think so. So about a thousand comments. So what we did here is we have the open floor format here in the uh, studio that we have Brenton and Ethan over here. We're gonna be kind of cultivating a conversation around these comments. So Brenton went ahead and collected a pile of different comments and he's gonna read them to Ethan and I, and then Ethan and I are gonna give our input to you guys about what we think about the comments and I mean, you give your input too, but I think that this is kind of a cool format where people get to see a little bit more about why we said what we did in the video, because mm -hmm. we can never really fully disclose all of the data points. Yeah. Well, so, I think I was telling you before this video, I think we could have gone for like, we could probably go for two hours just yeah. comments. It's crazy. Now I did kind of lay out some topics that yeah. we were going to cover. So typically what happens is Brenton will pick the comments and he'll read them to me blind and I have no freaking clue what direction he's coming from. But we do kind of have a format. Mm -hmm. Brenton's going to read those off. And then if you guys don't know Ethan, which you know Ethan by now, but if you don't, and he hasn't been on the channel for a while, but it's because he's been over on the Arcane channel talking all things thermal, night vision and things like that. So after this video, they should definitely check that out as well. Do you have any wisdom or any nuggets you want to share with the crew? Nothing right now. I'm sure there'll be some nuggets later. Cool. We want to see Ethan's nuggets and onward. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> First comment. What is it? All right. So among all the negative comments, we have a lot of good comments talking about the quality of the video. I'm just going to read one right here. Uh, this commenter says, currently the most underrated gun tuber out there right now, producing videos better than channels with millions of subscribers. So why do we do this? Yeah. So I hate the word gun tuber. First yeah, of all, yeah, know. you know That's how much that triggers me. I don't like being called a YouTuber. I don't know if Ethan gives a crap about it, but I don't like being called a gun I know it tuber. triggers you. Yeah, but, it drives uh, me bonkers. And I think it's because of what they're getting at. Yeah. Typically in the gun world, I think a lot of the companies have a pretty low quality channel where the historical videos that were presented are more like, hey, here's a table and two hands and we're talking about this thing. Now, I don't think that that's inherently wrong, but when we started, I would say, maturing the brand and really understanding what TA targets could be, we sort of went a different direction. And with where we're at right now, it's about storytelling. It's about trying to captivate the audience and create something that you guys are actually interested in, something that gives you information, but also entertains you. So we're sort of hitting it with a new formula. So yes, we are a steel target company, but the cultural aspect and the vision of the brand is far more than just steel targets. And because of the importance of the information that we give you guys, we cover a host of different topics. And we're going to talk a little bit more as we get through some of these comments as to how you can support some of these brands and the things that we're doing. But I would say that if you want to learn more, going over to the Arcane YouTube channel is going to be an awesome first step after you're done watching this video, of course. So that's just like a 30,000 foot view. Did you have anything else to add, Ethan? Like, I mean, obviously Ethan founded TA Targets with me. So, I mean, we were on quite a journey from, hey, let's make cool steel targets to now. I don't know it's what been you, a long journey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Comment two. No cap bussin says three thousand dollars. Yeah, that's so amazing, bro. The ordinary person can totally afford that right now. What do you think about that, Ethan? Because I know you you started buying the thermal before any of us. So, I, like, what's your thought around that mindset? You want to dive deep, or is this like surface level? This is wherever you want it to go. Medium tier. Medium tier. Okay, medium the tier. moderator over here says medium <laughs> I tier. I feel like, like for me, as a man raising a young family, for me to be able to have my life in order and also be able to personally buy the thermals that I was buying to start the the whole arcane journey says something in of itself. And I, granted, I have no context on where this person is coming from in the comments section, but maybe they have 12 kids, you know? Maybe that it's, I get it. Then it's like, yeah. If they would have the 13th, though, they'd have more money. Probably. The government would give it all back to them. <laughs> yeah. <that's... laughs> anyway, 
So you're you're kind of saying like, hey, get get your house in order. Get your house in order. If it like three thousand dollars doesn't go very far anymore these days. No. So if you don't have an extra couple thousand bucks sitting around, get yourself in order so that you can make moves if you had to. Yeah, and I think there's a misconception that everybody that buys thermal is making like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. And no. the reality is getting our financial house in order, it aligns with the seven Fs. I know at the end of the video, I talked about the seven Fs, but finance is one of them. And so if we want to have this kind of gear, we have to say one, we want it. Then we have to sacrifice certain things so we can get it. And what I've found in the gun industry, for any of you guys watching, typically the people that say they can't afford it, there's not many of them that are in that position because of good choices. How many PSA rifles exactly. are in the safe? Seven PSA rifles in the safe or something like that? And it's like, okay, maybe you should only have one and then bought the thermal. Exactly. Or if you are that guy that has five rifles in your safe, you know, I'm a I'm more of a simplistic guy anymore when it comes to rifles and gear. It's like all I want is a pistol and some kind of rifle that's very well rounded. Now I have more than that and we're blessed making content and stuff, but in my personal life, I have the 12.5 at home. And to me, that's like, it checks my boxes for what I need day to day. So if you have five of the same thing, you know, maybe you shouldn't complain about the price. Maybe we should get some priorities in line. Um, it is possible. It's very possible. Like you were saying, $3,000, you don't need to make a billion dollars a year to be able to save that. But, uh, you know, I responded to one guy in particular. He said, I'll basically, I'll never be able to afford that. And I was like, that's a really sucky attitude. And he got mad at me. He's like, bad attitude. And like kind of went off. And I was like, yes, it's a bad attitude. Because by you saying that, it means you're not going to put a plan in place to get it. Okay. Like I'm not a, you manifest yourself into things. You know 100%. how I feel about that. Yeah. That word has been abused, I think. Yeah. But the idea of manifesting is saying, I want something so then I'm going to put into action a plan to get it. Like you don't just will yourself into a thermal. You have to say, I no. want it. It costs this much money. I have to sacrifice in this way. And then it might take me a year to get it. If you don't do that, yeah, I. it's a bad attitude. I don't feel bad saying that at all. Um, I've been there in my life. I've made excuses. I'm not perfect. Everybody around the table here has probably done the same. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. All right, next comment comes from Mac001Texas. He says, cool video, but most LARPers will never need a thermal monocular, but they'll definitely waste the money on a helmet dual setup for their imaginary scenarios. There was a ton of comments going into how, essentially, you don't need this. You guys are just LARPing in this video. Yeah. You, don't, you just don't need it. Uh, I think Ethan and I will both have... I mean, in that video, yeah, I would agree we were LARPing. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That, that's exactly what was in that video. Yeah. Yeah. But when I truly go out in the darkness and... I'm hunting coyotes or if you are out in the darkness trying to evade or avoid other people, the thermal is going to show you those people faster. And you're delusional if you think only having night vision is going to be good enough in XYZ scenario. And I think there's this misconception because like, let's say I was a fireman and I was out there learning how to fight fires until the moment that I'm actually fighting a fire. I am a hundred percent LARPing. That is the literal definition of live action role playing. Like you are practicing by doing as much of a realistic task as possible. Everything up until the real event is LARPing. And so I'm over here like, so, okay, cool. I was out having so, fun. So we got practice. So we won't actually die when it actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least I know my gear. You know, the, the reality though is I look at events around the world and I know that some people think that we are fear mongering or all this other stuff, but I think we can use events from around the world to point to when tech like this becomes an advantage. And we don't get to choose when our corrupt government decides to finally throw us over the cliff and have somebody either invade or they truly embrace ty tyranny. And now we have to use this tech. So when you guys are out there watching these kinds of videos, understand that it isn't just about hunting or LARPing or all this other stuff. We have this core foundation in our country of rights that are supposed to be undeniable. And part of those rights are the right to have firearms and fighting gear to be able to fight tyrants. So the reality is it doesn't matter if it's just LARPing, if it means millions of people have this kind of kit on tap. And think about that in your communities. If you know that there's people like us all around you that have this kind of kit, how much harder is it 
for you to be conquered if it's mass proliferated. So I think this goes back to a bad attitude, bad mindset where this person probably has jealousy, doesn't have the gear, can't get the gear, feels like they can't get the gear. And instead of saying, I'm still appreciative that other people have it, they're over here being a, a negative Nancy. And on top of that, the video's intention was to educate in a very broad stroke as much as possible in a way that is easily digested, not like... Yeah, I didn't want to go out there and tell you guys all the specs. Again, if you want specs, Ethan's videos. Go check those out on Arcane. You will dive deep into the rabbit hole. On Ultimately, TA, we keep it simpler. Boiling it down. I mean, we're just telling a story and transmitting data to people so that it's actually, um, I don't know what the right word is I'm looking for, but so that it's Basically, entertaining yeah. basically like and if we can entertain you and create a couple valid points for you to consider in that process that's huge it's a win yeah to me that's a win so yeah i saw a lot of comments like that and i used to take it personal when people were saying that and then i really started thinking about it. it's like hey man everything's larping driving your car and you know practicing something or going out into a drift your car around a parking lot so that when you actually almost wipe out on a snowy road like that kind of stuff is LARPing. It is what it is. But it's like, I feel like it's the weird comic fests and stuff that get people like thinking you're dressing up as like Call of Duty and stuff. But no, uh, we actually have I cooler wasn't dressed gear. Up. There was no dressing up involved there. I think I walked out the door of the house with what I had on that whole day. <laughs> Ethan is a LARPer. <laughs> All the time. At heart. World. At heart. All right. So this next, this is a topic that I saw all over our comment section. I think over at arcane we should dive into it more but hiding from thermal everybody was talking about the predator mm -hmm. and about the mud, oh the mud scene about how people were hiding from mud so people were talking about mud glass <laughs> and uh thermal blankets uh, couple what, things. what do you guys uh, do logistically things? speaking out of all of those things what honestly would work the best is mud but reasonably speaking you only have a certain amount of time until your warmth is going to radiate through the mud but if you do completely cover yourself in earth, in cold earth, yeah. you're not only going to be suffering and miserable and cold, <laughs> but you would you would pretty successfully hide from a thermal for a little while. The the part that always blows my mind though is we kind of summarize these things into these black and white sort of situations. My favorite one is glass. Oh my god. People are like, and I want to do this sometime over on Arcane because they're <laughs> just like, run hey, through you just the need field to carry with a, a sheet of glass. glass. And I'm, just like, <laughs> I'm just like, you do realize I will see your fingertips in a perfect square <laughs> walking. Like the fact that you can't see through glass doesn't mean you can't see glass. Like I feel like we need to take a quick lesson, and Dr. Jared here has to point out you can see glass with thermal. I I just you can't see like through it. Some of you are just like, let's take a second. Let's let this simmer. Let's marinate on this for a moment. Look back at the ST6 footage of the highway and the vehicles and just, just observe. That's all I want you to do. The same thing goes with like the foil blanket thing. It's like, what do you use to zero the thermal? Aluminum foil. Yeah. Okay. Because so I can see it. <laughs> so you're a little... <laughs> It's hard to see certain things with thermal. When you're looking at cardboard, you can't see it. <laughs> so we just so I put a, a piece of aluminum foil tape, or I literally take aluminum foil out of a cabinet and use scotch tape and tape it to the cardboard. Let me let me ask you a serious question. Whatever here. It takes. Well, I'm, I'm over here crying and dying because I'm just envisioning this going down. Look, if this was a hostile environment and we knew that if anybody was out there, they're a target that we're engaging. Okay, with thermal, and you saw one of two things. Either a perfect, a perfect <laughs> square walking across the field or some goober with a tinfoil blanket. What are you doing? You're sending around into that. No, I, I probably wouldn't even send around. I'd be like, they're that freaking dumb. Doesn't even, they're not even a threat to me. <laughs> but I guess if it was a truly hostile environment, your, the, your enemy would look at each other and be like, are we serious? And then they would send around into that square piece of glass that you're carrying and you're, you're done. Like logistically speaking though, like there are some good points in there. I'm sure I didn't read through them all. I can't, I don't know the bandwidth for oh, trust it. Trust me. Most of them are like, you just carry a pane of glass with you. Like, <laughs> and 
if you were logistically speaking, if you wanted to hide from thermal, if you were setting up like a sniper's hide or something like that, you would have to, and, and I understand there are, is also clothing mm -hmm. that you can buy to help defeat thermal. And granted, some of this stuff's going to help, but I also know that slowly your heat is going to work its way into those fabrics. So basically, a lot of the concepts that are there in some of those outfits is a lot of layers mm -hmm. to the point where your heat can't radiate through all those layers to show the heat outwardly. So setting up a sniper's hide or something logistically like that, you could if you had the right air gaps between you and brush, mm -hmm. you and other dense thick things you can you could logistically set up a way to hide from thermal but you're not running through a cornfield and hiding from thermal it's not possible no and you're not moving <laughs> to the next position and hiding from and that's no. the my point with this video wasn't to show you guys how to defeat thermal or else i would have called it how to defeat thermal like that just wasn't the point the point is I quickly in one video wanted to show people here's where thermal technology is and here's why you should pay attention because it's fun for all of you to get on your keyboard and say, oh, I'll just run with a ghillie suit that's made by XYZ company. It's like, cool, it's $3,000. Half the people just said they you can't afford You just said you thermal. can't afford the thermal itself. So yeah. you're not definitely not buying the ghillie suit. No, and on top of that, like, so you're gonna train with that. You're gonna have a buddy with the thermal that's as good of quality as yours that you're gonna compare whether or not you can or can't defeat it. And if you have the ability to do this, you should be doing it, that's awesome. But I'm, I'm not trying to tell people how to defeat it in this video. I just want to point out that if you want to defeat it, your best bet is to not freaking go anywhere. Like you, you can't, the tech is so prevalent and it's everywhere that like, it doesn't matter how you move. If somebody has thermal, somebody on your crew, it's will likely be, be picking up on it. Yeah. Especially if there's multiple dudes with thermal, somebody's going to be like, there's something, there's fishy something weird yeah. going on there. I don't know what it is. Anyway, that, that was fun. That was really funny. All right, so obviously we talked a lot about dual band systems in that video. So this one's actually for you, Ethan, because you've talked about this over at Arcane. So give me like your 30 second answer to this one. So this is from the Instagram talking about the video, your, your Instagram post talking about the video. But uh, Sandart93 says, how does the eye compensate for night vision and thermal together in a bridged version? Is this something that is easy or does it literally screw your eyes and head up? So... Uh Logistically speaking, we have a, we do have a full video on that over at Arcane, so you guys can go find that. Um, I think it's, can you merge night vision and thermal? Yep. So I logistically talk through that whole video about my personal experience and journey through that process to learn that. But on a really quick surface level, when I'm out in the darkness, I am not trying to merge night vision and thermal in my brain. It's logistically not possible. There's going to be some people that say, oh, I can, I can, yeah, okay, now do it for five hours straight. You're going to be laying there with a headache or wanting to just go to bed because you have so much brain fatigue. So basically, you're running with night vision when you're moving, and occasionally while you're walking, if you don't need to be looking at the ground or the obstacles, you can be scanning with the thermal while you're moving. But I'm not merging the two in my brain. That does not happen. So, yeah. Yeah. So watch that video. If you, watch that video. If, if that'll learn that'll really help you guys understand the journey that I went through to learn that and basically help you set expectations of a dual band system as you're stepping into your first dual band system, which again, 100,000 foot view, don't try and merge it in your brain. Use one or the other. All right, this next question, you put out another post um, talking about scopes, like, mm -hmm. would you rather use a dedicated thermal scope or just a normal, yeah, normal optic? So, uh, Black Rifle Bear says no to using a thermal scope due to limited battery life and runtime on the core. Clip on thermal when needed. However, also all thermal sniper kills from Ukraine are from dedicated scopes. So there's that. So what would you guys say to push back against dedicated thermal? So I, I I'll share one thing because I have less time with dedicated <laughs> thermal than Ethan. And more, I spend most of my time with daytime glass. Those are valid points, I would say. Like from and there's they're a valid, but they're also invalid, and I'll counteract that. Yeah. Then. So I'll share my lens, and and basically here's what I'm here's what I'm gonna say. I saw comments about battery life. I saw comments about how somehow thermal scopes don't have the precision of daytime glass. Huh. And I saw that like durability, longevity, I saw questions around that. So battery life is going to largely depend on what unit you're running and what battery type it has. 
you know, anything with an 18650, like having 18650s on deck is not difficult. And when we're seeing this tech increasing, it's just like every other electronics, the battery lives tend to uh, be longer than they were before, or they're easy to quick change out. Like we're not talking yep. about having to plug your scope in and charge it in the wall, you know, for six hours and then go out and use it. So when I look at this as, and when I pose that question, can you run a dedicated thermal and is it viable as a primary object? The answer to that is going to, in my opinion, be yes, but, and the but leaves this blank for you to define ultimately what you're doing. It's a personal preference. Yeah, it literally comes down to personal preference. So like in that video at the end there, we're smashing steel targets at like 120 yards in the daylight with thermal. I can see the steel target perfectly. And there was misconceptions about that as well, where just because it's not alive that you can't see it. Is it harder to see sometimes? It depends on the temperature of the background versus the temperature of the plate. Yep. But at the same time, I'm it's able to engage. Out. Yeah, I'm able to engage targets in a way that's extremely accurate. As far as the accuracy, you might just suck at zeroing a thermal <laughs> scope because it takes a little it's a bit little nuanced. It's a little bit nuanced versus daytime glass. But the reality here is if you're a guy like me that says mostly daytime glass is what I run. There's thermal clip on options like the RH25 that give you the ability, just like this guy said, but I'm going to push back and say, get on Reddit and type in like Ukraine thermal and the amount like, dude, I swear Pulsar is like privately funding that operation. <laughs> like they're not, but people are actually on Reddit. They're buying like tons of Pulsar units hmm. and shipping them over to Ukraine. So like when I was digging, I ended up not using a lot of the content in the video but I found like a hundred images of dudes with Pulsar scopes on like AKs and stuff. It's crazy. So like they are using thermal in a dedicated capacity. And I would also push back in one other direction. Why don't you have an offset dot? Like if you have something oh, exactly. that has a dead, a, a battery life that's in measured in hours instead of days, months, weeks, or whatever, have a backup optic. And you, you saw at the end of the video, I was running an offset red dot in the day with a thermal as a primary, very viable. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, my biggest thing is, yeah, it doesn't matter what thermal optic you have, batteries are batteries. And ultimately battery life is irrelevant if you can plan. I'm planning to be out for the next three days and I wanna be able to run my thermal all throughout the night. I don't have to during the day while I'm resting or wh whatever that is. You can do the math. You can figure out how many batteries you need. You know, roughly maybe, all right, I'm going to be back at base tonight. And so you'll be able to get more batteries or charge more batteries. Like batteries are batteries. It's no different than your cell phone. It's no different than the ham radio that you're running. Yeah. You logistically have to maybe need to be more intentional about flipping the thermal over to standby mode to get you 10 hours of runtime instead of six. Yeah. I know when I go out in the dark, I power mine up when I walk out the door and it does not shut off until I walk back in the house. So yeah. you're talking every time I'm out, my thermal is running four to six hours straight every mm -hmm. time. And usually I don't have to switch batteries in that window of time. But if I push past that six hour mark, it's really like simple to plug and play a new battery and you're chugging again another six hours. And I think so. the one area that I don't think enough people know about, and I think I know thermal's gotten better at it, but it still takes some time is power up time. And so I do think that there's an aspect that, you know, on one hand, everyone's like, you're never getting into engagements like this. You never need this tech. And then on the other hand, they're like, but if you did, <laughs> and then they come with this other left hook, but like the one thing that it's I will say something. is it does take five or six seconds to power up these units. So, from standby, from it's stand usually instant. Right. But, but if you're like caught off guard where you got to slap another battery in and you got to power, yeah, okay. There's a difference there between like you're running a one to eight or one to 10 scope or a thermal. But again, if it's daytime and you have an offset red dot, you can take shots. If it's nighttime, your LPO, that LPVO doesn't mean anything anyway. So unless you got a clip on. So that's yeah. my thought. Well, and I think honestly, expanding on that, I'm going to ask this to you, Ethan. So Johnny asks, no doubt have a backup though. And he's talking about thermal. Microcircuits hate recoil, heat, water, dust, temp changes, 
and barking dogs. I don't know if the barking dogs. I don't know the barking dogs. But I don't, I don't know, know what that's that like means. A, <laughs> but 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 speak thing. to what to what um like obviously you you go out. I nightly. have thoroughly and heavily abused a lot of different units across this whole entire industry. And I, I don't know if you got some B-roll you could show my thermal unit or something, but it is flogged. The I do not baby my gear. The majority of the time, it's never in a case. It's, it is, I literally just throw it in the bed of the truck and it flies around in the bed of the truck sometimes, get literally just getting beat up. And I pick the thing up and it, change batteries, whatever I got to do, power it up and kill stuff. So to speak to that even a little bit more, I've had an RH50 on my 243 for the last year and a half, maybe even a little bit more now. I zeroed that optic once. It was probably about a year and a half because it would have been October of 22, I think. Actually, it might have been 21. I'm totally losing track of time. Regardless, it's been on that rifle a long time, and I never had to touch the zero, ever. It it holds zero. It remembers what it needs to remember, even changing batteries. So there's a lot of these concerns that are just completely invalid because I'm shooting coyotes at 300 plus yards. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do want to take one second too to just let you guys know, and I wanted to plug this for a second. Go over to arcane.com, check out the website. We're going to put some links down in the description because all the stuff that Ethan's talking about, we are curating over there. So the website itself is full of a ton of different data and information, but there's also blogs there. We have our newsletter, which you all should should, should, should sign up for. You should sign up for. So make sure you sign up for that newsletter. But even further, like when we're talking about all this data, it's easy to get super overwhelmed. It's easy to get stuck in a rabbit hole of death when you're on Reddit or every other forum that's talking about night vision. And frankly, most of that information that you see there is being presented by people that have like one unit that purchased one thing and then go out and give their opinion about it. So if you want to go on a deep dive with us, we have the tools and resources to do that. And we've handled so many units. So when you're tapping into either our customer service team or you're scheduling a call with Ethan, What you're doing is bypassing this massive hurdle, which is two things, time and money. Doesn't matter if you're not paying for that information. When you're spending gobs and gobs and gobs of time, you are paying for it in other ways. So if you want to expedite that, we have tons of information over at Arcane. And there is another option if you want to get on a call with Ethan. We'll put all that information down in the description. You guys can book those calls and then he'll save you stupid expensive mistakes that we've all made, unfortunately, but we made them so you don't have to. That's right. So I just wanted to plug that in there please, real quick. Please use our experience to save yourself time and money. All right. Mason Max 1000 says, one thing night vision have, has over thermal is the fact that it's not digital because digital has delay. Milliseconds count in combat. Yes. So I looked at the delay of a... So I looked <laughs> oh my at... Gosh. I looked at basically like to blink. You, when you blink your eyes, it's like a third of a second or whatever. So basically that 60 hertz refresh rate is ballpark of you blinking your eyes. Naturally, your eye can't process anything faster than 40 hertz. So if it's a thermal that's even at 30 hertz, for you to be able to even see the difference between 30 hertz and 60 hertz is going to be very difficult and likely almost not even possible. Yeah, I've never, of all the years of seeing that comment for the refresh rate, Ever since we touched the first MH25s and I put them on my head, I'm like, I could run two of these. Like, the only thing is the shutter. Like, that is a valid point where it you, does click, click. But it's, even that is like a half a second. It's like, and yeah, you can definitely see it. Like, it pauses the image, refreshes, and then you're back to running again. Yep, you can turn that on yeah. manual too. You can, you can turn, turn off the automatics setting that nukes the thermal and turn it on manual so that you only nuke that thermal when you're ready. Yep. When I'm coyote hunting, it really, it's not that critical if it nukes in the middle of me almost taking a shot. It and just, they, you even saw that in some of the footage. Like yeah, some oh of the yeah. footage You'll we had see, from the SD6, like you can see it kind of jump a little bit. It's like, that's what's happening. But it, so watch the video and look at those nuances and it's not a glitch in YouTube. Like I showed some of that. Yeah. All right. 
this one I've seen a few times, not too often, but it's a good question. Um, how is heat in the form of radiation from your can affect your sight picture in the weapon mounted therm thermal, and I guess in head mounted as well? Like, so does, does your suppressor heat affect thermal? It, I guess it could. So, so one thing that I've noticed, it's really only relevant if you have like a 1x base magnification yeah. thermal. And you, you can, can like actually see. see the front of the gun when you're looking through that 1x base magnification thermal, like an RH-25. When I dedicate an RH-25 to my weapon and I have it on 1x, I can see the suppressor on the end of the gun. So the hotter the suppressor gets, the more it could affect the window that the thermal's working in. So thermals work in windows. And this is really going down a rabbit hole, but thermals work in windows, okay? They only have this range that they can operate in. And if it sees something really, really hot, it pulls that whole range up. And it won't show you things that are on the lower end of that spectrum. Vice versa, if there's something really, really cold, it's going to pull the whole spectrum down and it's going to mess with what appears to be your contrast in that thermal. So on 1x base magnification thermals, that is a legitimate concern. But the second you jump up to like a 3x base magnification thermal, you're jumping right past that suppressor. You can't see it in the thermal. So the thermal's not analyzing the data and the heat off that suppressor. So it's not going to matter. Yeah, I don't have to have anything else to say other than like you run a regular dedicated thermal scope. You're not, it's just like running a 3x base scope, a yep. daytime scope. You don't see the can. If you can't see it, it's not processing it. So, yep. Perfect. All right. APS Tech, they say your title's all wrong. You should rename it. Thermal night vision will smoke you and your night vision. So, I, I know you made comments about yeah, how. It, yeah. If I listened to everybody that said I should title something differently, the videos would have half the views that they do. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> what the heck comes down to. I, I titled it specifically that way because it's it's a little bit of an irony is that thermal will get you killed and people thought when they clicked on the video there's a whole there's a percentage of people that were like oh using thermal means it's not it's inferior so I'll die because I'm using thermal and it like triggered this response and I'm glad it did because I titled it somewhat clickbaity um but yeah I don't know I mean thermal will get you killed because the guy that's going to kill you has thermal it's just that simple that's right this is a quick one for you Ethan and I know you'll like this one um, Ali Rat Anderson says, I don't, I didn't like the video of killing an animal. There's a place in hell for people who are cruel to animals. So I just hope you know that. I guess I'm going to hell. <laughs> we all determine what's cruel and not differently. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And then the last, this is the last thing I want to discuss. Um, I'm not even going to pick a comment from this because there's a bunch of different rabbit trails we can go down. I want to talk at a base level. What is the future of thermal? I know Swear was mentioned. A lot of other things were mentioned. Gotcha. What, so, what is the future? This is really surface level. There's a lot of different bandwidths, okay? You got analog night vision that can see in a lower bandwidth of the infrared spectrum. You got thermal, which is at the top end of that infrared spectrum. And on a really surface level, SWEAR is a shortwave infrared, but it's a higher wave than what night vision, like analog night vision, is seeing. And then when you go into something like an inod, that's a mid-wave device. And that's a little bit closer to thermal than night vision. But all around, that's that's where this tech is heading. I really think that not only are we going to see more fusion devices, I also think we're going to see more devices in the SWEAR category, which is above night vision, below thermal. And in like the inod and mid-wave thermal category, I think we'll slowly see the technology develop and those things will become more of a norm. Yeah, I think, you know, trying to show people where this is going to go, like Ethan and I have seen some really freaking cool things that we can't even talk about. And that sounds like we're just flexing that. I'm, I'm serious. Like, we can't talk about it. NDAs and such. <laughs> but knowing where we're headed and seeing some of the tech that exists and that will hit the consumer market in the next three to five years... Fusion is sort of like the easiest one for us to explain and have people comprehend because it's marrying the best traits of night vision along with the most potent traits of thermal and creating a way to blend them together. There's downsides to that, like with current 
thermal fusion, there's very, very few options for a regular person like you or I to get our hands on. Really, the only one that you can easily get a, a hold of through us or any other company is the JFB. We did a whole video on that as well. So we can put a card or something up here, or you can just check that out on the Arcane channel. But regardless, there's downsides of that. And largely to me, I'm hungry for the time, even if it's just fusion, where you basically can, at a whim, choose to have fusion overlay on both of your eyes or have it switch from your right eye to your left eye, be able to turn it on and off quickly. Like right now, typically, like the JFB, for example, you've got a, a thermal monocular and two analog intensifier tubes, but it's only showing up in one of your eyes. Yep. So it's the opposite of what some people would want to run in a dual band, which gives it a bit of a disadvantage depending on what your actual use case is. But when we get to the, the phase of this technology where I can say, oh no, I want it to appear and project on my left tube, I start to get really excited. Even if it's not the SWEAR or any of the other crazy stuff inside of that spectrum, once that's mainstream and it's easily obtainable, Yes, it's going to cost you guys whatever ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe it'll be less then. Who knows? I mean, that's but the that's the trend. That's the ballpark. Is you're in that range of binos. You know what people were trying to get gray market PVS thirty ones or whatever they were dropping ten, twelve, thirteen grand for. Well, now through our company over at Arcane, you can get fusion for that price too. So it's already beginning, I would say, to become proliferated. But we're at the very baby phases of that. And our response to that, knowing that right now it's not mature enough to get into the hands of everybody, is to do what Ethan's doing. And that's run dual band systems. And when we say that, it just means marrying a PVS-14 over one of your eyes, using a bridge of some flavor, and then a thermal monocular over your other eye. And now that is giving you the best of both worlds. But to me, like I, it sounds crazy, but like someday there will be technology and maybe it's like the apple vision yeah, pro kind vision of thing pro. where like yeah. it just looks and feels totally different like maybe there's a day where we're no longer like having binos or panos or like things that are huge and the technology could exist to support that and apple vision right now is like the one thing that i feel like they'll incorporate maybe someday you know what i mean but i feel like it'll be junk thermal but like all those users of that kind of tech will be like oh i've got thermal and the reality is we might move toward a reality like that at some point and it likely will be faster than we think if that makes sense i don't know if you have anything else to add i went on like a total rabbit trail nothing crazy i mean you got other tech that is being developed now and starting to be used and tested and a lot of it's military only mm -hmm. like if, if you guys want to go down a rabbit trail start google searching about the ivas system ivas Look it up. There's public information out there on it. You can learn about it a little bit, yeah. read some articles on it, but it is a wild looking system and it's, it's military only. And it, it's starting to unlock some of the, those merging technology between night vision and thermal and what all is in that particular, um, set of panoramic overlay. It's, it's wild. Look it up. Yeah, it basically looks like people wearing Apple Vision on their face. Basically, but yeah. Some kind of heads up something. And, you know, that technology that was coming. So, you know, I think I watched a video we reviewed, one that Ethan was doing. It shouldn't stop you guys from getting into the tech. I know a lot of people like to say, well, I'm going to wait to see where it's headed. Don't. You're going to wait too long. Don't basically. wait. You're, this tech is advancing so rapidly. Just the thought process here is... Don't wait to get into the tech. Just because you buy it, even if in six months a new model comes out, a new revision comes out, that doesn't mean that old model isn't going to work. Yeah, you might be missing a feature or something. That, yeah, it might have been nice, but ultimately having the thermal and the night vision technology is, to me personally, is way more important than having the newest thing because it's no different than an iPhone. They're on what? What are they on? 15? 16? Yeah, I don't even yeah, know. I think, 15? I think 15. I got a 12 in yeah. my pocket. That's insane. How did they jump three? Like, that's how fast thermal is also advancing, too. So. Yeah. And that's the opposite spectrum for analog night vision. Analog night vision is not 
advancing at those rates. Basically, if you look back at the tech that was being used in the Vietnam era, it's a heck of a lot better now, obviously, but how they do the things that they do is very simple or very similar, what just highly refined. Highly refined, the equipment that they make the stuff with got better so that they were able to maintain higher standards, basically is what I've, has helped drive analog night vision forward more so than a change in the technology. Mm -hmm. But it's still taking existing ambient light and amplifying it and thermal is not thermal is a totally different beast so thermal has the capability to year over year have these massive leaps and bounds and i know a lot of people ask about digital night vision we're just not there yet we're not at the point where the digital that exists at least from my experience is even close to a quality pvs 14 i don't know if you know anything else every time i see digital night vision it's like yeah that's not like sure with infrared if you're running infrared, yeah, they look great. They look amazing. But then you're a beacon to anybody yeah. else with anything that can see an infrared light because you're shining a light to even be able to see with your device. <laughs> there was a funny comment I saw. I don't, you, I'm sure you didn't grab this. And I'll, I'll, I think I'll I'm shut thinking about of the this. same one. But yeah. He was like, this guy asked a question. He's like, okay, so let me see if I understand. So basically, if two dudes have night vision and both have infrared illuminators, It'd be no different than me standing in a field with my buddy on the other and shining my white light back and forth. It's like, yeah, it's exactly like that. <laughs> it's exactly like that. And yeah, it, so if much. you think from a tactics standpoint for all these people trying to say that we were showing tactics or whatever, yeah, if you're running IR at all, somebody can see you. There wasn't vision. anything tactical about that video. Let's just boil that down real fast. <laughs> Listen, I just wanted to show Ethan with a 10-3 <laughs> and a PVS-14. That was so <laughs> insulting to me. Dude, all I had was night vision and a short rifle. That's totally the opposite of what I run around in the dark with. Uh, I know. I just wanted to. I just. I just wanted to flex on it a little bit. I mean, you flexed. So. Made me look like a retard. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else? Nope. That'd be so it. So guys, I, I hope. I uh, hope this was entertaining for you. I hope it was a little bit educational as well. Sort of recapping this, I would encourage you guys to check the links down in the description. We're going to put some information down there as well. If you want to do one of those phone calls with Ethan, I'm going to put a link directly to that product page and you guys can follow the instructions there. I highly recommend it because he's not going to steer you wrong. It's going to save you possibly hundreds of hours. And here's the deal with night vision and thermal. If you buy the wrong thing the first time, that is a mistake that could be thousands of dollars. And that's why it's so important to dial in exactly what you want. If you're the kind of guy like me and Ethan who kind of figure stuff out on our own, you might not need to call Ethan. Just email our customer service team if you have questions. We'll answer all your questions, get you squared away. But there's some people out there that definitely would benefit from just having a pointed conversation. So if that's you, check it out. All the other information, products, blogs, all that stuff is over on Arcane. Do you have anything else to add, Ethan? Nope. Catch you guys in the next one.